of Bits and Bytes, we're going to give you an idea of the range of ready-made programs that you can get for the computer. We'll also look into the question of the computer's speed and what ROM and RAM mean. Now here's Billy Van. Look at the programs that are available. No, 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 there's so many of them. I wouldn't even know where to begin. Think about what you might like the computer to do for you. Oh, I don't know. Well, do you need help with anything? Well, my finances, mainly. You know, I can't seem to get the upper hand. It's all the little diddly things, like working out your income tax, paying your bills, deciding on a new mortgage. The list goes on and on. Look along the shelves behind you. I think you'll find a program on home accounting. Okay. See now, general ledger, business, statistics. Ah, home accounting. Here we are. Oh, there's that machine I worked on the other day. Okay. All right. Switch on. TV screen on. Slow down, not so fast. I don't think that'll work. Well, sure it will. I remember how to load this thing. Flap up, disc in, flap down. Hey, wait a minute. Something wrong here. What did I do wrong? That's what I was trying to tell you. You should have read the rest of the label on the disc. Okay. A TRS-80 disk will only work on a TRS-80 computer. TRS-80? What does that mean? TRS stands for Tandy Radio Shack. There's a TRS-80 across the counter. Oh, I see. But the point is, your disk with the accounting program will only work on that particular machine. It won't work on any other computer. Well, is it the same for all these programs? I'm afraid it is. You cannot transfer programs between microcomputers. It might be possible one day, but it hasn't happened yet. Well, why is that? Because the programming is slightly different for each type of computer. There's no standardization. The field's too new. The first micro only came on the market in 1977. They haven't had time to standardize. No, I suppose not. So this home accounting program goes into the Radio Shack computer. Okay, I'll switch on and be in the back. Oh, no. It's on the side. Okay. Flap up. Disc in. Flap down. Now what? You see the orange button? Press that. Orange button. Oh, here we are. Well, what's all this? It's not really meant to be read. It's just copyright information. The accounting program is coming up in a moment. Now, type in the date and the time. Why do we need that? because it helps you keep track of when you use certain programs. Oh, huh. okay. And then press return? Actually, on the Radio Shack, you press a key marked Enter, but it's the same. Oh, here it is. Now type the time. Okay. Ah, here we go. Home accounting system. One, personal budget. Two, balance bank account. Three, mortgage amortization. That's what I'll try. Okay, let's type three. Enter. Amount of mortgage. Ooh, 40,000. Interest rate, 16%. Years amortized, uh, 15. Term in years, 10 years. Enter. To see all your payments for the first year, type Y for yes, then enter. Okay, Y, enter. Oh. Now press the space bar for each succeeding year. Oh. <laughs> I definitely have to ask for that raise. That's amazing. It all comes up so fast. 
You could argue that all this could be done with a calculator or even with paper and pencil, but you'd never get all those figures to come up so fast. In a way, we're now touching on the secret of the computer's power, its speed. The electric current travels through the computer's circuits at very close to the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, which is about one billion kilometers per hour. If an astronaut were able to travel as fast as that, he would be able to go to the moon and back in just under four seconds. One, two, on the moon, three, four, back on Earth. So, since just one chip inside the computer can contain many thousands of electric circuits, and since chips are so small that you could fit 25 of them onto a postage stamp, you can see that it's quite easy for an electric current to make the rounds of all the computer circuits in a few billionths of a second, and thus enable the computer to perceive many millions of different on, off switching patterns in one second. But it's very difficult for us to grasp what all this means, since our perception of time is so completely different. Here's a familiar example. This appears to be a moving picture of a horse and rider, but it isn't. It's a series of still pictures, which are being projected at the rate of 24 frames per second to give us the illusion of continuous flowing movement. The illusion works because the human eye cannot perceive anything that lasts for much less than 1 24th of a second. If we painted every 24th frame of this film black, we'd only just be able to glimpse it at normal film speed because it would only be on the screen for 1 24th of a second. This is just about the limit of our perception of time. If it comes in chunks much smaller than 1 24th of a second, it scarcely exists at all as far as we're concerned. For example, if we could speed the film up to, say, 48 frames per second, the black frame would disappear altogether. In fact, for most purposes, our everyday life is divided into hours and minutes and seconds, whereas the computer lives in a world of thousands of a second milliseconds, millionths of a second, microseconds, and billionths of a second, nanoseconds. If the computer could see us, to its eyes, we would appear to be moving about as fast as a lump of rock. And the second or so that it takes us to decide which key to press next would seem like a delay of seven or eight years. Poor old humans. Not very fast, are we? The computer showing me all my mortgage payments at the speed of light. Yes, and it can do the same for your family budgeting, your income tax, your checking account, you name it. Wait a minute. Maybe it could be my personal accountant. Well, not quite. And then, when I'm finished with them, instead of giving them a great big check, I could... May I? Sure. I could take my accountant out of the disk drive, put him in his little envelope without the great big check, and then I... Wait a minute. Why is the program still on the screen when I've taken the disk out? Well, let's recap. When you load a program, what you're doing is copying the entire program into the computer's memory. Yes. So once that's done, you don't need the disk anymore. It doesn't have to stay in the disk drive, does it? I guess not. That's why you were able to take the disk out of the disk drive and yet still have the program on the screen. Really? Let's run through the whole process again. First of all, you must lose the program. You don't need to turn the computer off to do this. With Radio Shack, you just press the orange button. It has the same effect. Okay. Now the program is no longer in the computer, right? Right. Now load the accounting program once again, and as soon as you finish loading, take the disk out of the disk drive. How will I know when it's finished loading? You'll hear it. You can hear the sound of a disc loading. That's right, I forgot. And you'll see it. That's what the red light's for. It's only on when the disc is loading. As soon as the loading stops, the red light will go out. Okay. So, 
disc in, flap down. Push orange button, red light on, whirring sound. Tell me, if I was to stick my fingers into the disc drive when the red light is on, would my fingers get loaded into the computer's memory too? No, because as soon as you lift the flap, the disk drive will stop. Okay. Okay, so red light out, whirring stops, flap up, fingers safe, disk out, and the whole program is already back in the computer, right? Yes. You see how it works now? Will wonders ever cease? But you know, rather than go through all this home accounting thing again, is there something else I could look at? Oh, yes, there are loads and loads of software around. Software? You know, I keep hearing that word. What exactly does it mean? The computers themselves are hard, so they're called hardware. And the instructions that make the computers work, the programs, are abstract. The opposite of hard, they're soft, so they're called software. You can choose any of the software on the shelves behind you. <laughs> well, that is easier said than done. There must be hundreds of these ready-made programs. It's true that there are huge quantities of software for micros on the market. But that raises the question, how is this material created in the first place? We went to the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium to see how they go about producing educational software. We take ideas that come from the actual classrooms, from teachers, from MEC staff who are working out in the fields. We collect those ideas. We, we kind of wait and we think we have enough to put together a whole package or a collection of programs. We kind of summarize that and we say, we think that this is what our application or our, our new disks might be. The uh, ISD manager selects a particular project to be done. And ISD manager selects one of the courseware developers who is going to head the team that develops that project. The members would include teachers, subject matter consultants, designers, programmers, graphic art people and possibly our editor. They then sit down and say, okay, how can we put this together? How can we make it happen? What we can see here is the job of the courseware developer and what cannot be seen, what makes it all work, is the job of the student programmer and in turn my job. When the program is approximately 60% done, we start to think about what a user support material is going to look like or what it might be and then the design person produces that. Finally, when we get the products done, which takes anywhere from six months to 12 months. We then go through review, review, and review. MEC is not thinking in terms of, of delivering entire courses at this point. Possibly sometime in the future we will. Right now we're designing supplemental instructional packages to support or facilitate what the teacher is doing rather than actually doing the job of teaching a course. The microcomputer is just a tool to assist them in teaching it. We just visited a classroom where these little kindergartners were singing the ABCs as they were doing that uh, Caterpillar program on Elementary 7, and they were really having a good time with it. When you get away from just content and you think of the microcomputer and all the things that it can do above and beyond what a textbook can do, that's where things get exciting capabilities of graphics and sound are one of the real pluses of the microcomputers. Well, there are a couple of forms that the instructional designers fill out and give to the student programmers. One of them is this form, the display layout form. This indicates how a particular screen should appear, and it's usually pretty exact where it, everything should appear on the screen, and how it should look. This is a frame for one program in our diskette elementary seven. A random number of blocks was chosen, and the number appeared out to the side. On the next line, another random number of blocks is chosen and a number to the side, and a line drawn underneath. The student is expected now to add the blocks. You can count or you can add the numbers and press the number. This is indicated here by the sum, and if he gets it wrong twice, the correct answer is indicated here on the bottom of the screen. The student programmer is directed pretty clearly as to how things should appear on the screen. And he gets to use his imagination on deciding how is he going to do this. We uh, work primarily with student programmers. These are high school and college level students that do most of the programming at MEC. 
we have two full-time programmers that are more or less in charge of that crew of student programmers. The programmers will debug the program and probably add extra features and uh, clean up anything like misspelled words, sentences, and in proper format. We'll do an extensive review process. The programmer will get the program, he'll get it running, he'll give it to the documentation people, do a review of the program, and make decisions on the content of the program itself, and they give it back to the programmer. And that goes back and forth until everybody's happy, and then they document it and put it out for a release. There's now several companies that have come up with, with mass duplication machines where you basically put a bunch of items in a hopper and press a button and, and they flip out the bottom. But the process that we use here is a, a manual one. One disk in as master, make one copy. And for the way MEC distributes courseware, we can handle that because our, our unit sales of disk probably aren't more than 30 a day. Most of the courseware in Minnesota is obtained by teachers educators coming to what we call disco parties. Dis, CO out of copy. Disco parties, and what they do there is copy their, their disc. They bring in 15, 20 blank discs. They spend five hours copying them, and they drive home. So we use that method to distribute courseware in Minnesota, and we estimate that about 50,000 diskettes are made each two to three months. And the demand for mech software is just really gone up. We don't see that it's anywhere near tabling off at this point. We really haven't come near uh, finding out what these things can do yet. I think we send kids to school for, for two reasons, and only two reasons. One is to be a better communicator, and two is to be a problem solver. Now, the computer can't do a lot in communication unless you were to view the fact that it can allow you to get at more information and make you a better communicator but it sure can make you a better problem solver because you solve more problems in different variables and different features and you don't just solve problem 11 in the back of the chapter and go on to the next chapter. You try three or four combinations so you learn what the concepts are and, and how to solve problems and, and the computer is a problem solver and we need problem solving aids. And MEC is by no means the only producer of educational software. There are many other publishers in the field, both in Canada and the U.S. There are lots of educational programs for the computers. Is there anything in particular you'd like to learn? Oh, hey, that might be fun. As a matter of fact, I've been trying to learn French. Do you think the computer could help me with my French? It sure can. Look under education. Okay. Let's see now. Uh, social studies, history, math, English, biology, chemistry. Here we are. Conversational French. Now, these cassettes have to go into a particular computer, is that right? Right. Okay, and this one says it's for the Atari. And there's an Atari computer next to the Radio Shack computer. Okay. Oh, I can't wait to get going at this one. All right, here we go. Computer on. Vision screen on. Cassette in. Cassette. Recorder. Now press play. Okay. And then load. C load on this particular computer. It stands for cassette load. Type C L O A D. Okay. And then return. That's it, but press it twice in this case. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. That's the sound of bits and bytes again, isn't it? Right. This cassette works a little differently from most other ones. Instead of just containing binary information, bits and bytes, it has two tracks, one with binary code and the other with ordinary audio. That means you'll be able to hear your French lessons as well as read them on the screen. Ah, it's ready to go. Okay, so I type run, I suppose. Let me see now. R, U, N, and then return, and, okay. Then E, S, C, where is that, E, S, ah, here we are. Où est lui? Où est lui? Can the computer understand me? No, I'm afraid not. 
It's very difficult for computers to understand spoken language. This one certainly is unable to. Il est à une fête. Où est Anne? Où est Anne? This is fun. Elle est à l'école. We just found out that Anne is at school. Où sont Louis et Anne? Où sont Louis et Anne? Ils sont à l'aéroport. Ils sont à l'aéroport. Où sont Chantal et Anne? Elles sont à l'école. Très bien. Merci beaucoup. You know, this is fantastic. The computer has been my accountant, now it's provided me with my French teachers, and if they talk too much, I can merely turn them off. But there's one thing I don't understand. How does the computer do it? Do what? Well, if I wipe its memory clean every time I turn it off, how does it know how to load a cassette or a disc when I turn it on again? But you don't wipe everything out of its memory when you turn it off. You mean it forgets some things and remembers others? Precisely. The computer has a memory that you can change and a memory that you cannot change. Two quite different sorts of memory, in fact. A computer is really just a collection of switches that can either be on or off. When we feed messages into this maze of switches, what we're doing is getting them to form various temporary patterns of ons and offs in the computer's memory. But we can't do this to all the switches, because some of them have already been organized into preset patterns before the computer leaves the factory. These switches are stuck, and they consist of permanent instructions on how to load programs, how to print things on the screen, and so on. The computer can read this left half of its memory, but it can't write on it. It can't change it. It is therefore called read-only memory, or ROM. But the computer can, in a sense, write on the other half of its memory. This half is called random access memory, or RAM. Because the computer can write temporary messages anywhere it likes here, it has random access to this part of its memory. But if you switch the computer off and then on, the messages in its random access memory disappear. The loose switches are scrambled once again, whereas the instructions in the read-only memory stay as before. The switches are still stuck in the same position. Of course, you don't necessarily have to program messages into RAM yourself. You can load a ready-made program full of messages into it from a cassette or a disc. You can take the cassette or disc away and the messages will remain. But naturally, if you turn the computer off and then on, once again, the messages will disappear. But at least you've still got the originals on your cassette or floppy disk. So ROM is read-only memory, and it's permanent. It never forgets. Whereas RAM is both read and write memory, and it's temporary. It forgets at the flick of a switch. ROM and RAM, ROM and RAM. ROM wasn't built in a day, so it's here to stay. And RAM is here today and gone tomorrow. Exactly, you've got it. So that the contents of RAM come from the outside, whereas the contents of ROM are already in the computer. Is that right? By and large, yes. But you can add extra ROM to some computers by using a ROM pack. A ROM pack? Open the lid at the top of the Atari and pull the cartridge out. All right. That's a ROM pack, a way of extending the permanent instructions in the Atari. There's no magnetic material inside, as in a cassette or disc, just a chip with extra ROM memory on it. So this is information for ROM, and this 
is information for RAM. Is that right? That's it. But I think that's enough about ROM and RAM. Let's have a look at what we're going to see in our next television program. Billy Van is going to write a little program of his own. Hey, I see. Congratulations. You have written your first computer program. Do you mean to tell me that this first line is a complete program? Yes. Now, it's probably the world's shortest program, but it is a complete program. Well, you have to admit, not too bad for a beginner. We'll see how the central processing unit works. Inside the office is a very literal-minded clerk. He is called Central Processing Unit, or CPU for short. Some instructions like this. CPU will put straight into his RAM box and then go away and mark time until you give him the command run. CPU will then return to the RAM box and read the first instruction which tells him to print something. CPU promptly nips across to his ROM box and looks up how to print. Then he prints something and gives it to you at the output hatch. We'll watch some young programmers in action. Those little people right there are fleeing citizens. He can eat those. You're heading east. This is atomized. We'll send a computer to the store to buy some milk. But if you had to get a computer to run errands for you, it would be a different story. Unlike the little boy, it wouldn't know where to find milk. So first of all, you'd have to tell it to go to the nearest corner store. But of course, it wouldn't know what to do when it got there. So then you'd have to tell it to look for the milk in order to be able to answer the question, is there any milk in the store? But even if the answer were yes, the computer still wouldn't know what to do next. You would have to tell it to buy some of this milk and bring it home. And we'll find out what the two basic programming operations are. This is the first basic operation performed by a computer program, repetition. And here is the second basic operation performed by a computer program, yes, no decision. The inner workings of all computer programs however complicated they may appear on the surface, are all variations on these two basic themes, repetition and decision. Until then, I'm Luba Goy for Bits and Bytes. And I'm Billy Van. Bye for now. <laughs>